several others. Uh, feel free to ch chime in with uh, Jack as he goes through his presentation. And I happen to throw in uh, a little picture from Chula Vista's rooftop operation here for him. So without any further ado, uh, is Jack with us? Did we double check, make sure he's here? I know he was on earlier. Yeah, I'm here. I got you. Thank you for your expertise and sharing with us. I'm going <clears> to <throat> mute my microphone and I'll just move the slides forward as you're ready. <clears throat> okay, so uh, this, I don't know which slides you got up because I'm not seeing the whole picture here, but um, it should be, uh, okay, that's the matter. Go to the next one. Okay, so what we've been using it for, we, we also work with our fire department, so a lot of the other stuff that, that y'all talked about before is applicable to us as well. We have an integrated program with our fire department, but for law enforcement use, um, <clears throat> suspect apprehension, uh, we've, got a, we've had a couple of situations that uh, we've assisted um, other agencies with locating suspects uh, using the drone, both in FLIR mode and visual mode. SWAT support, which... Uh, it goes everywhere from barricaded situation, barricaded subjects to uh, to warrant services. Uh, and most recently, protests and civil unrest, where we were able to uh, provide real time uh, data back to our command uh, using the AMB uh, pro platform. Uh, instead of uh, having a real show of force on these deals, what we did was we were able to parallel with officers the uh, the route that these uh, uh, protesters were taking and deploy officers in areas to block intersections for them without having a, a, a huge presence there, kind of keeping things down on low. Uh, crash investigations, this picture here I took, uh, this was a, uh, obviously was a motorcycle. Um, we just happened to have somebody in inter uh, accident investigation course at the time that took this picture, rescaled it to what the ground station shot, and they were able to put a picture with the uh, with the, uh, the measurements they had, which of course, you know, you know juries love pictures and videos. so. Uh, infrastructure inspection, uh, we have a 300 foot radio tower and I don't think I had to tell anybody how much it costs to get somebody to climb one of those to change the light bulbs. So um, I took a lot of pictures of that for that. Um, and it, that goes, there's yeah, other say, infrastructure that we do as well. I'd say not to cut you off, but if we just jump these slides and as we're um, kind of covering these, just continue to add in Jack as far as- Yeah, not a problem. How, cause like, so we talked about suspect apprehend, apprehend right. and uh, how is that basically so, eliminating that officer, right? You're locating, and I think we have a video on the next slide. Um, well, yeah, to go into suspect apprehension real quick, um, just as a, just kind of give you an example on a warrant that we served, I was sent ahead uh, to, uh, to start feeding back information to the SWAT commander as they were coming to the scene. So I was about 10 minutes ahead of them. And what we were able to do is actually, they changed their plan on the way to the warrant service, uh, just based on the intel I was giving them. So, and then we used the drone as a distraction device in order to, uh, they actually had an MRAP sitting in their front yard before they even realized it was there. So uh, it, it does eliminate officers walking into to, to situations where the, the, the original plan for that warrant was not ideal, uh, given the, the new information that we were able to to provide to the SWAT team. So, um, and then of course we watched the whole thing. They had, uh, <laughs> with this particular one, they had uh, a bunch of escape routes. It was about a two to three acre area with, uh, it was kind of wooded on one side. And they were able to, uh, we were able to give them the overwatch because we did have some people try to get out the back of the house, uh, on, you know, while the SWAT team was approaching from the front. So, uh, so we covered all that. And then, you know, in the next one, um, we've, the ability for the drone, if, you, if you're lucky enough to get one in the air uh, on a ground search, you, it's real easy to get people uh, that other perspective in order to get people in the right place to, to uh, head people off or what have you. So uh, I don't know what this. Uh, you can kick ahead, you can kick ahead Andy to that. Yeah, let's go to, I don't, this suspect that your video, I'm not sure what this one is. This, I don't believe this one's my video. So. No, this is not. This was just a video showing the thermal. Yeah. So I, I looked at the Autel uh, Evo 2 Dual yesterday, the other day, and uh, I don't know if y'all are using XT2s, you might want to consider changing out. The, the, the Autel is pretty amazing. It's uh, It gives you a picture a lot like what this one's showing on the, the, the next slide with the thermal view. So the when the gentleman's on top of the house. Well, correct, yeah. 
Um, this one right here. Yeah. yeah, that one there. Yeah, that's the. I'm not sure who's who's uh, camera we're using, but it's definitely using the black hot color palette. So right, right. This is from Daytona Beach Police Department. Yeah, I'm not sure what they're what equipment they're using. That's pretty amazing stuff there, but. Um, and uh, if you will, Jack, one of the things that we talk to firefighters about is a lot of the color palettes are really confusing to us. So we stick yes. with a very simple one, uh, you know, the TI basic, but in, in this world, like the black hot or reverse polarity is valuable from the law enforcement standpoint because a victim or a person or a suspect can blend in due to solar loading or washout. That's where, correct. Where I can make them stand out and say, hey, there's your guy. Uh, he's on that rooftop and he's 15 feet away from you. That's, that's powerful life-saving data for the law enforcement, correct? Absolutely. And, and some of these, these FLIR images are getting so good that you can actually see if they're carrying a weapon with them. And, uh, you know, that, of course, you can't, you, you can't put enough value on that. Um, and I, go ahead. I say, you know, he's there. Like if, to play, if this video played out, you would see that the, the officers kind of know that he's on the roof, but they can't see right. what he's doing on the roof. So right. That drone up there, it allows you to know this suspect, he's not armed, he's not hiding, he's really trying to get away, and maybe we can approach, we, he's more approachable. Um, yeah. yeah, correct. Or, you know, just knowing which direction he's facing is huge. Uh, you can redeploy assets to, to kind of flank if you need to, if you've got an open area where you're trying to catch somebody. Um, we did test the, uh, the color palette in a field, on a field that was uniform, that was more of a uniform temperature, and uh, there are some applications where the color palette can come into play where it helps out. Um, you know, if you're looking for a specific temperature for front range or something like that, or if you think they may be embedded into some vegetation or what have you. So um, we did find, uh, we have found a, a use for that as well. Um, I guess we'll go to the next one there. Yeah, we can uh, kind of push ahead. Yep. Okay. Which you want to go on to next one? Uh, the SWAT, SWAT situations. I mean, we kind of covered that with, uh, with the arm thing. Um, We've had situations where we've we've had people who have had weapons, threatening family members. You know, officers arrive on scene. Uh, we put a drone in the air. We don't know where the suspect is. So you know, with the use of FLIR, we can we can kind of root out where around the house they're at. We found people around houses and we're able to get officers to the right place without exposing them to a whole lot of danger. Um, you know, the most recent one, uh, the guy had threatened his wife, and and so he was outside the house. And being able to put, uh, we didn't want a bunch of officers walking up the street five or six, you know, a full block length trying to get to something uh, with, with this guy. We knew he had a weapon. So uh, the Overwatch portion of it, it part of it, uh, you know, just letting the uh, letting the SWAT commander know where uh, electrical boxes are, uh, water cutoff, uh, things of that nature, stuff you don't you don't really think about, or in pre-planning, we can uh, we can go and do a 360 flight, and uh, if SWAT's the, deciding to hit, they want to hit a particular door. Which side of the door is the doorknob is on? Which ones are windows? What may be a more hardened door than others? Where outside obstacles may be in areas where we can't really see. Um, like you may not have very good intel on what the back of the house looks like, but you're going to deploy assets back there. We can go kind of pre-plan that and get uh, get that intel for these uh, these SWAT teams before they even do execute their warrant so they kind of know what they're walking into um a big one that, that i've noticed is they really like to know which side of the door the doorknob is on so that they know which side the breaching team needs to hit um what additional doors may be there uh obstacles in the backyard things of that nature of course providing overwatch uh, for a particular scene um you could be amazed at what you can get if you can get a drone to look through a second story window. Say you've got a, a, a SWAT standoff on a, in an apartment building. Um, we've been able to use it to see inside of a building that, that SWAT's previously hit with, with uh, something to break the window and, and, and see how hard the door is that they're about to go through. And you uh, we had a, I'm sorry? You were talking about Overwatch, and I guess just to kind of continue moving things along with like yeah. the protest and civil unrest. That kind of is like the big Overwatch, um, right? Right now it is, yeah. Ability that we've seen. So I know um, you mentioned you had that experience where you were able to to see this route where you have cameras that are on the ground, like around right. this market house, and then even here with with the 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 Chaz Zone in in California, like we have ground cameras and things, but how do we increase 
the ability to make decisions and, and, and oversee things. So I guess. Right. So with the, of course, the, the 210 series has, has, has the Z30. And, um, you know, being able to stand off at 1,000 feet away from your target location and, and, and not allowing so that the people on the ground don't see or hear you and using that camera system to zoom in to see what's going on behind the lines. Obviously, you're, you're not putting anybody in danger by doing that, but you can gather a great deal of intel. Um, by doing that flyovers of those types of things. Um, being able to record, uh, seeing what's going on in there and recording the, you know, the people that are in there. So for future apprehensions, if you need to. Um, Jack, I'd like, I'd like to add that with the recent things that we've had in our department, if we had had an overwatch, some of our firefighters and police wouldn't have been hurt. Exactly they, right. They, they would have seen a large group of people coming that we didn't know was coming. So right. the, was, our most recent one, there was a, it was about, it really wasn't that, it was about 2000 people, but the thing stretched out for over a mile and you know, you can't put enough eyes on the ground to really get a, a good situational, you know, have a good situational awareness of what you're getting into. So, uh, that was a huge benefit to us. We were able to give that, that stream back to, uh, to our command and they were able to make decisions based on what they were seeing from the air without, you know, a whole lot. There was no communication between us and command. They were seeing it just as we were, we were sending it back to them. So they were able to just get the information direct from what the, from the live stream that they were getting and send it back out into the field without having to interpret things back and forth. So, so that, that increased operation of that increased, increased sexual awareness is, is huge. Uh, you know, going on with SWAT situation, we can send drones into buildings. Uh, we haven't had a great deal of experience with that recently. Um, but as you know, you get a broken window in, or an open door, you can send a smaller drone in and get, get whatever you need. So, um, hey, Jack, real quick, one of the questions, Jack, one yeah. of the questions in the chat popped up is uh, protesters using drones. Can you address that? Did you encounter any of that? We, we didn't have any protesters using drones. We actually asked the FAA for a, uh, um, a, a a temporary flight restriction for the area, um, but they wouldn't grant it to us. They said if something came up, we could do that. We didn't have that situation come up. I put on a presentation for our officers that if they saw any drones, that to contact whoever was piloting them, get the information. And if they were in violation of uh, FAA regulations, the ground immediately get the information to me. The only drones we had to show up were uh, a couple of news uh, news media outlets um, that that were that quickly when we addressed it, they were real, more than welcome to, uh, more than happy to comply with whatever request we had as far as altitude and what have you. Um, I've given my guys a little bit uh, of an overview on what they, what, what is unacceptable and kind of instructed them to, unless otherwise just get the information and get it back to us. But luckily we haven't had a whole lot of that down here. We've had a lot of that in our in the San Francisco Bay Area. Down again. He says, well, if the numbers keep going like they're going, we may not be. We we lost yeah. audio. Yeah, we lost audio on him. I don't know what happened. Jack, would you like to chime in a little bit more about crash investigation and the accident and how that helped you or helps? There's a couple good slides here about. So on the crash investigation, um, what we're able to do is – what we're doing right now is we're working with uh, Sky Brows uh, to, um, all right, so I'll give them a little bit of a plug, but uh, since this stuff hasn't been vetted in court yet, as far as the county that we, we have to file cases in, it's gonna take a little bit of vetting on this. So the, on the crash investigation portion of it though, what I can do in about 15 minutes, what well, takes a ground station, uh, you know, two to three hours to do. And I don't have to tell anybody on here that how much money that saves and how much angst that it, it saves the department having to field calls for roads being closed and all that type of thing. Um, we're still working on uh, getting our courts to recognize these measurements on these, uh, these uh, programs as an alternative to uh, ground station. Uh, but like before, before we were using any kind of uh, uh, software like that, just getting the pictures and having to rescale them in order to fit into the uh, measurements the ground station takes. As we all know, juries and, and lawyers and everybody like pictures and video. And when you give a, I think that that picture gives more impact, uh, more victim impact to the, uh, 
to the jury, they, they can actually see, okay, there's not just dots on a thing. There's not just pictures from the ground. We're actually looking at it from the ground, from, the, from, the, from up above. And uh, so we're still working on the, on the, the crash investigation portion of it, but we're going to, the goal is to take and not necessarily replace the ground station, but use uh, the, uh, the aerial stuff more instead of, as trying to replace some of the ground station stuff with, with aerial instead of uh, tying up resources on the ground for a long period of time. This, I'd say this, this right here, this clip, uh, you're seeing sky brows in action. So this is a model. You, know, you map fly fly this, and I'm gonna just put in the two cents from the drone side of it. Uh, Skybrow is super easy, changing mapping for public safety because of the ease of operation. It doesn't require um, a lot of pre-planning. And once you've created this model, you can now go in here and you can pull out uh, different sections. You can modify it, get different uh, crush factor, impact, um, just, just pull all sorts of data. And again, you're doing this quickly and efficiently and clearing the roadway, um, whether it's daytime or nighttime. Yeah, and that's, that's really important for officer safety uh, as well as just getting the public moving again. Um, everybody hates when highways are closed. Um, and, and it's right that sky browse is so easy to use that you don't have to work with it all the time in order to, to be able to get up in the air and quickly get your mission going and, and end it and, and get the information back. You're not waiting hours uh, to get that map back. So that's a huge benefit to our crash teams and it's a huge benefit to the to public in general and the departments are saving a lot of money not having to keep personnel on the roadway. Jack, we'll send out a, a, a thank you email to all the attendees that I'll have some information about SkyBrowse, Pix4D, and all the different softwares. We're going to do another webinar just on software applications to give yeah. them. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing right. with us, especially your expertise and personal experience with it. Um, Mr. Mike Chapman's going to cover a brief overview of search and rescue, which is probably uh, in the world we're living in right now. It, it ties in very well to what uh, Jack was talking about with uh, basically civil unrest and disasters and man made or natural uh there's a lot of things that that drones can be very very helpful and beneficial so uh, mike you with us yes sir so in the comment that i made earlier the uh, the relevance and the importance of having subject matter experts in all these areas for search and rescue for law enforcement for hazmat no one person can uh, can be expert in all those areas and the pilot themselves they have to be expert in flying the drone so you've got to have communications you've got to have integrated command and all these people have to work together executing a search uh, from the drone aspect in terms of performing the search and then the people that are monitoring uh, the aids, the visual uh, uh, observers uh, or the folks on the ground that are looking at the data for the lost person perhaps or whatever it is that we're doing with the drone uh, you know again they have to all have that specific knowledge and it's going to vary uh, from situation to situation so with your initial assessment not much different than hazmat in in regards to uh, rapid uh, assessment of the area that we're looking at uh, hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, uh, mass casualty incidents, as uh, Andy mentioned with plane crashes or motor vehicle accidents, things like that earlier. Uh, lost person searches, uh, you know, are unique in and of themselves. Um, you know, locating those victims, uh, you essentially start with the uh, concentric circles, uh, with confidence intervals moving out from that center point of, we believe this person, you know, based on the amount of time that uh, they've been lost, they're going to be within this circle. Uh, or we have a high confidence or, or this level is going to be within this circle. And then you move out in concentric rings from there. And so how would you search that concentric ring uh, type pattern with the drone? Can you do autonomous searches? Yes, is the answer. There's different software packages out there to accommodate that. And, uh, and we're going to, as Andy said, uh, perhaps do a, uh, a webinar on those uh, packages. But uh, those are different things that, uh, that come into play. Uh, if you're looking at a flood, you know, it's not necessarily a perfectly regular uh, a pattern or situation that you're going to be uh, flying over, you know, with Overwatch. Uh, are, are you looking at damage assessment from the flood or are you looking for the victims? Uh, perhaps people stranded and stuck in trees or stranded on roofs uh, in houses that have been flooded. Uh, so, you know, all those are different considerations. But bottom line is that the drone is giving you eyes in the sky for faster searches of large areas uh, when looking for those lost persons or just collecting that information as a whole. Uh, remember that pattern search concept, uh, in addition to the autonomous flight, uh, is important uh, because in order to uh, make sure that you've searched all of the area, you know, in a methodical approach, 
whether you're looking at a, an urban search and rescue, like in the photos that you see here, where you're perhaps flying into a building, uh, or if you're looking at a, an area that's been hit by a storm, a hurricane or tornado, uh, or looking for a lost person in a field, having a pattern search, making sure that you don't miss any areas uh, is really crucial. Uh, you wanna make sure that your, your uh, search was, was executed you know, professionally, and uh, and that we didn't miss, you know, we didn't just throw things out there haphazardly. Uh, there's many uh, videos and many uh, um, tra breadcrumb type trajectories that are saved online, where you can look at searches that that took place, and it's it's literally just a spaghetti bowl uh, of of pattern where the drone flew in a completely random uh, pattern, and uh, and in most cases, the experts will. Uh, that a pattern search would give you when you've got uh, expertise, not only flying that uh, that pattern, uh, looking for uh, wherever it is you're looking looking at, but also uh, skilled observers looking uh, and interpreting that data as well. One really important thing before we move on is, is learning the relevant thermography. Uh, we touched on it earlier. A couple people mentioned color palettes. Uh, Andy mentioned solar loading, uh, thermal crossover. Uh, all of those are really, really important. Isotherms is another one. Uh, and while we're not teaching a thermography class today, you need to be aware if you're a drone pilot uh, how those things apply and relate to the different types of situations that you're flying because the color palettes in and of themselves are going to operate differently in different circumstances different uh, weather conditions different target versus background conditions the isotherms the same way uh, different weather conditions the isotherms are going to benefit you or, or cause you hassle in different ways uh, so you have to understand how best to apply those things. And it may sound a little bit uh, silly, but somebody that's colorblind, you know, people are going to see imagery differently. And so what I may like as a, either a color palette or an isotherm that may work well for me is not going to necessarily work for this, for a different pilot in the same way. So figure out what works and what doesn't work. And the bottom line, uh, as Paul mentioned, is practice. You have to practice with these drones. And so not only having your 107, but having a COA so that you could fly at night or your night waiver, allowing you to test and try out these different things and, uh, and get the expertise prior to an event is really important. All right, next slide. So you can see flying over the, uh, the floods here, you know, how getting a drone up and overhead, you know, you can certainly get a different perspective uh, of a large area uh, that you're needing to scan for uh, impacted area, damage assessment, uh, or again, perhaps lost persons. You know, you can see the, uh, the hovercraft in the, uh, the top right corner of this image here uh, that is in the woods. If you're not above this area, you'd not have any idea uh, that, that anything was in there, whether it's a lost person or even a boat. Really unique method and very efficient method for identifying where you need to put your rescue resources. Personnel resources are very hard to come by uh, in natural disasters uh, like this. Uh, and helicopters and rescue helicopters are even more difficult to come by. Uh, because the resources are expensive uh, and they're, uh, uh, they're just, they're hard to get. So having a drone fly over a large area, triaging that space, figuring out where victims might be, and then deploying your assets straight to the location where you uh, have got somebody is a far better use of, uh, of that resource for rescue than using those resources to simply just look around. Uh, obviously, you see here thermally, uh, the white hot versus the, uh, uh, the red, red spot uh, heat detection capability of a person uh, uh, stranded in the water, you know, uh, you got to remember that with any of your thermal cameras, you're not going to see through the water. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you look closely, you'll see a reflection of that person's uh, arms and head on the water. Uh, so only the thing that's sticking out, only the parts of the body sticking out of the water are what's going to be visible with that thermal camera. But don't forget, the left and the top right images here are visual images. And so very relevant and, uh, and appropriate to, to figure out what works best for you. Uh, is uh, is it going to be the visual camera or is it going to be the thermal camera or a combination of the two? Next slide. Uh, again, you can see here uh, the water here, uh, the contamination potentially, hazardous materials potentially involved in this. And so getting a good scope and understanding of the extent of spread. Uh, are there people stuck or stranded on these roofs? You know, with these cars, are there people stuck in the cars? Do you need to deploy a life vest or a personal flotation device? Uh, a Mavic uh, type of drone, a uh, small drone, is not going to be able to, uh, to deploy uh, uh, an asset like uh, a radio, bottles of water, or, or a uh, life jacket like you see here uh, with this larger drone. So, you know, keeping in mind that uh, different drones have different applications, there's no silver bullet uh, to, to solve every solution. Uh, having a, a toolbox with different uh, resources is really what's important. Next slide. 
Again, you see here from the damage assessment standpoint, what I want you to look at is um, you're looking at damage assessment on both of these slides here. And I don't know if we've got uh, uh, Mansfield still on or not, but um, what you see here is you see damage in both, but think of uh, the, the image down below. If you had a pre-survey uh, of this neighborhood or this community with no damage and then a post uh, survey where there was damage of that same area, uh, how valuable is that? Uh, in terms of uh, being able to do a rapid assessment, figure out uh, not only the streets, as Andy was talking about earlier, where you are, uh, but uh, potentially, uh, you know, who or how uh, your community was impacted. Uh, really Mike, really if you don't mind me jump in here real quick. Um, Please. This was, uh, this was a Dallas tornado. Um, and we actually put uh, drone pilots at each sub-command center. Uh, Dallas Fire Rescue sent out um, uh, uh, command centers all over the city. They, they assign them an area, a gridded area. Um, we actually flew from those sites and in the mass confusion, what we were able to do was to say, hey, you're standing under the drone or we've extended you up to 300 feet. This is what you can see. And that gave the, the, uh, the, that scene commander a much better perspective on how to deploy what assets he needed. And also what it gave us was the ability to uh, direct um, Encore, which is our electric provider, to those areas in order to 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 really get a better understanding of how it was how power outages were affecting the area, uh, and and you can clearly see the track on the second photograph. You can see where the where the the tornado actually went through. So it's it's all about gaining perspective. A helicopter in the air is great, but they're telling you what they're seeing from where they're at. When you can put that drone at that command center and put it straight up in the air, they can actually look on them. It actually gives that scene commander a better perspective they can take and look at their map and look at what they're seeing on that. And it gives them a, a lot better perspective on what they need to do and where they need to deploy their assets. That's right. Those are great points. And, uh, and, you know, with regard to that video, you know, streaming that feed to multiple people on the ground is also uh, of great value and very easily accomplished with the drones. And not only that, you mentioned power lines. Uh, so uh, looking at power lines, being able to identify potentially live power lines on the ground is also something you can do with a thermal camera. Again, it's not a perfect tool, but it is a tool that is, uh, uh, is effective. And um, so again, there's, your, your mind is the limit in terms of how you can use these drones. And it comes down to practice and implementation, teamwork and communications with other people that are using them for different things uh, to learn what, uh, what you can and can't do. All right, next slide. Uh, with this one here, um, you know, uh, Jack, I don't know if um, you want to comment here on the, on the crane, but when you've got, uh, you know, damage to a building or damage to a structure, having the eyes overhead uh, in terms of structural integrity is really important uh, for the responders uh, as well as the other uh, people that might be trapped inside. And, um, you know, this is just a perspective that you can't get without putting somebody in harm's way unless you've got eyes in the sky. Uh, yeah, that's, that's right. And what we were able to do is, um, I was at this scene. We put uh, my unit right down there at the fire command so that they could see it. I have a 42 inch TV in the back of my car. And so they were able to all gather around look at exactly what we were looking at. There's no, there, there's, you don't have to worry about communication or anything like that. Um, and they were able to see the damage from the top. It's real easy to walk in the building, but it's another thing to see, okay, what kind of structural damage do you have from the top and how is that going to affect everything below it? As you can see this big hole over here, that's a five-story parking structure that uh, actually went all the way to the ground level. We put drones inside that um, area to look for possible victims because fire rescue could not access that area due to all the damage. Um, <clears throat> we were called out the next day by OSHA to go ahead and continue doing damage assessment. So that crane actually rotated 45 degrees on its base before it collapsed. Um, it, it was a huge windstorm, but to be able to give fire command this perspective so that they know what they're dealing with from the top down. Uh, also using infrared in order to see what possible heat sources, um, electrical, gas, anything that may be leaking in there, uh, gave them you know, a lot better, a lot more information to work with so that they knew how they were gonna attack the situation. Uh, luckily, this was a, a single fatality incident, thankfully, so. Thank you for mentioning all that. That's all fantastic. And I'll also point out that uh, these last two slides uh, you might recognize are all visual. And so while I work for FLIR and, and thermal imagery has you know, unique uh, and great capabilities, again, I'll remind you, visual has its place uh, just like thermal does. And you have to know when and how to apply each of them because <clears throat> visual is really all you need here in this circumstance. 
And that's like, like uh, when I had a forage vigil and everything, our uh, picture with apartments and flooding and everything. Another, another thing we didn't talk about is uh, reimbursement through like FEMA. Um, so those pictures I provided back uh, to the township actually just, you know, boosted our funding from FEMA. Um, so that'd be another great point. You know, um, you know, your township can potentially, you know, buy your better drone by you taking these pictures and data, et cetera, and then, you know, getting more reimbursement back. That's a great point. In terms of buying your resources, you got to think about the fact that your drones, uh, let's just say you're spending 10 or $20,000 on a drone. You're talking about one or two hours of flight time in a uh, helicopter aerial asset. Once you figure in the, uh, the asset itself, the, uh, the crew, the insurance and all that kind of stuff, the fuel involved. And so the drones are certainly really easily reimbursed uh, in circumstances like this for the capabilities that they can provide. Uh, what you're looking at here is uh, basically a wildland, you know, kind of a, a simulated missing person here or somebody walking down a path uh, maybe that was lost. And you're looking at uh, both the visual and the thermal. This is the MSX overlay showing the visual and the thermal composite. And, uh, and if you look down this path here, uh, as this person is walking, uh, you'll see that they disappear a couple of times under the canopy. And so, again, you have to know and understand that uh, somebody hidden underneath, you know, leaves or foliage is not going to easily be seen. You know, if it's a time of year where there's not very much foliage on the on the trees, or if you've got openings in that canopy, you will be able to see them. But it's not uh, it's not magic. It's not X-ray vision. You're not going to be able to see through walls. And so uh, again, you have to understand the limitations. And uh, what looks like two people here is not. So again, you have to understand your cameras and what's happening here. You're looking at two views, both your thermal and the visual. And so you have to adjust the parallax. It's easily done in the settings here. And when you adjust the parallax, you're basically bringing the camera uh, image alignment together so that ultimately this appears to be one person like it actually is uh, instead of uh, what appears to be two or a ghost off to the left there. And uh, so we can move on to the next slide. Uh, your color palettes there uh, obviously change and uh, we won't uh, waste any more time on the color palettes, but different color palettes are gonna give you different uh, imagery back. And I'll uh, point that out on the last slide that I have here in just a minute. Uh, what you're seeing here is just another use case for, uh, for the drones. And uh, in this particular case, uh, a drone was deployed to help resources in the field that were performing a search. And uh, they actually needed IV bags uh, to hydrate people. And uh, they were well back into the woods, uh, very difficult to reach terrain. And so they ended up ferrying IV bags for hydration of not only the, uh, the lost person, but the responders uh, themselves for hydration. Uh, back into the woods and so you've got uh, basically a tether or a rope that's uh, extended down uh, with a bucket or a bag on the end uh, that's got uh, uh, contents in it for the uh, for the rescuers so uh, just you know, keep in mind there's so many different applications here and you have to do what you need to uh, to to accommodate that situation all right andy next slide uh damage assessment here this is like our, our slide earlier again you're looking at uh uh, a situation where you've got uh, mass massive building damage, uh, and uh, you know, with West Texas, you know, think about the explosion uh, that took place that caused damage. So it's not always a tornado or a hurricane that's causing uh, damage and uh, uh, destruction to buildings here and, and potential loss of life or injuries, uh, but you've got uh, explosions themselves that do the same thing. And so understanding what the building looked like prior uh, and then after and then uh, doing a rapid assert assessment of this situation. I mean, this building has only half a roof, so you can rapidly uh, you know, do overflight on that, uh, that building and see if there's anybody uh, potentially uh, in that building still. Uh, you might be able to see somebody's exposed. Thermal is gonna help you here, even though it's in the daylight. Uh, if you can get a contrasting difference between the, uh, the background and the target's uh, temperature that you're looking at. So, next slide. And then finally here, uh, tracking a scuba diver. As I said, you cannot see underwater with, uh, with a thermal imaging camera, infrared camera, but what you can see is the temperature gradient on the top of the water. And so what you're looking at here, while as you can't see the scuba diver underwater uh, and you don't really have good accountability for that person, uh, this scuba diver is actually swimming at about 21 feet uh, or, uh, or six or seven meters depth. And uh, you're able to track them because of the temperature difference because of the water uh, that uh, is coming from the depth up to the surface. The air that they're breathing out from their, uh, their scuba tank underwater is grabbing that cooler water and sending it to the surface. And so it's mixing with the warmer water on the surface. And then in the top right of this video uh, clip here, you're able to see 
that cooler water coming up, bubbling up to the surface. And so you can identify where that scuba diver is and have full accountability for them in the water. So uh, there's a, a lot of different capabilities here. You know, you can see with the different color palettes, uh, some are, are better than others. And so it just comes back to your expertise, your level of training, and, uh, and knowing how to apply these different features and functions of the camera and the equipment to the different search situations that you're, uh, that you're encountering. Andy, I believe that's about it for me. All right, and if anyone's interested, all the photos and videos, we give credits to them at the end and where we got them from. Uh, we thank everybody for their contributions in those uh, because a lot of this content wouldn't be possible without a lot of the subject matter experts and those out in the field contributing. Uh, now we will bring on uh, Antonio and Rick. They're gonna talk about the power of lighting and how that's uh, important to us, whether it's a uh, drone or a combination of drone and ground lighting. Antonio, Rick, you with us? Yes, yeah. sir. And then, um, hi everyone, I'm Antonio with Fox Ferry Lighting Solutions. Um, I'm gonna introduce uh, Rick Smith from Antioch Police Department out uh, here in California, and he's gonna talk about some of his use cases first. I uh, believe, next slide, please. This is our Mavic Air that we have set up. And you see the inverted view on the right has got a D3060 Fox Tree light on it. Originally, we were flying doing interior flights for our SWAT operations and um, burglary clearances. And these UAVs just don't like dark rooms. As you can see, this is equipped. We also had to use an extended landing gear to keep it from uh, tilting when it lands. But this one light in itself actually made this UAV extremely capable to go and robust to go into almost any situation that there is zero lighting um, from interior clearing to vehicle clearing to nighttime ops, you name it, we're, we're good with this. Uh, next slide. This is a, I also work for LACRTC, we're a um, training company that's a nonprofit out of SoCal. This is at one of our facilities we train at, and this was with the lighting attached as we're flying through the hallways, it's a uh, behavioral center that's been abandoned and we fly all through these buildings and with this lighting, we're able to fly freely through here without any problems. Um, next slide. Again, continuing through here, we can clear these buildings and, and save personnel in case we can encounter an armed suspect, a down suspect, especially with this COVID-19. We've used our Mavic Air to do interior flights. We have suspected people down through an opening, a window, a door, fly in to make sure we have the proper PPE prior to going in. And if we have a deceased inside, we're able to locate. Same on suspect searches. We can down this behind closed doors and give live feed to our uh, staff as they're making entry for our tactical team. Next slide. This was a recent uh, burglary at a little gas mom and pop shop. The window was smashed. It wasn't good enough for us to put a canine through the window or an officer do the amount of debris and collapse from the floor. So one of my pilots used his, his uh, Mavic Air with the lighting to fly through the interior to clear to see if there's any suspects inside. And one of the big things that you look on that left picture further back, there's the bulletproof glass that's around the register. There's about an 18 inch opening on the top. Next slide. As he's flying through, he's clearing the interior. He has to navigate up and over that. You see that left picture. He flew right over the top of that, was able to identify the fact the store was clear because the store owner had almost an hour ETA to respond. It saved resources of us sitting on a perimeter waiting for a key. We are able to determine there was no one in that building. Next slide. And a lot of this is done basically because we have the proper lighting. Without that lighting, this drone will not have operated correctly. We use that same lighting we attach to our ME2s, our enterprises, to supplement the downlight and all of our other platforms um, allows us to put light in the room so we can live stream and everyone can see within what we're seeing. So well, one of the guys good. on the panel asked a question about you have connectivity issues when you're flying inside the building at all, Rick? No, we have not had one issue. Um, we bring our pilots up behind our armored vehicles or behind our patrol cars with the armored doors um, as close as we can, but we don't expose them. We keep them in cover. We have found out we do get interference through our Bearcats and we actually have um, some other armored vehicles. The IR thrown off by those armored vehicles, our MRAP, for instance, you can't work anywhere near the MRAP or from within it because there's just so much interference. 
interference. It doesn't allow the drones to operate. Even our larger platforms won't operate near or inside because the IR is thrown off by them. Thank you. So we have to keep a distance. And then Rick, could I, could I ask you to speak on um, multi-drone operations? So, I mean, there's times where you guys are sending in either multiple drones inside of an of a, of a actual structure or sometimes outdoor stuff. Well, we, well uh, for the exterior, the way we deploy, if we have a SWAT op, um, I've got a pretty robust team. We have 16 platforms now, getting ready to expand to 20 with six pilots. Um, we're getting ready to expand that to 12 pilots. But we will do pre-flights for SWAT ops, like previously mentioned by other presenters. And on a SWAT op, we will have three Overwatch flying, two at a time, one on the like, launch pad ready to go for a hot swap. So we have constant intel, and we break the house up for those that are tacticians, uh, the front being the one side, then you know, one, two, three, four corners number in the house. We'll trisect or bisect that house on corners so we have live there. When we fly interior, we'll fly two drones at a time. And the point of that is, is number one, we have a backup. Number two, we'll do it just like we clear the building in a stack. And we come to a room, one will lock down uh, the hallway and what hasn't been cleared, while the other one clears that room and circles back. And the point of that is, is you don't want to play cat and mouse with the suspect inside. If you go into a room, that suspect can go from another room that you just cleared or you just, a room that hasn't been cleared to a room that you just cleared and not be able to locate them. So you can do both. Um, it's, you want to make sure you have that unclear area covered as you're flying through. So we'll fly in tandem for interior flights. And then we'll have a third drone if possible in case one goes down. If we have a battery problem or battery issue, one of the, one of the UAVs will down themselves in a location where they get the best overview. We'll do a hot swap on a battery, get them both refreshed, and then continue through that resonance. And then our stack will follow in behind. It just gives them the safety. If we encounter a closed or locked door, we will down in front of that door so they have a live image in case that door opens up or someone presents themselves. Okay. Thank you, Rick. And then for uh, just in light of time, I just saw what time that it is. I'll briefly mention this portion with respect to lighting. Um, the team's done a great job communicating why the drones are helpful, how it helps with speed, how it helps with, with decision making. At the end of the day, there's a lot of bad stuff that happens at night. And so um, absent, uh, at, well, you need the lighting on the drone to be uh, legally able to fly. But uh, with things like night reconstruction, especially in rural areas, I read a stat, it's 91% of rural crashes happen in uh, dark, uh, small roads. So the lighting is important, whether the lighting is um, attached to the drone, whether the lighting is um, on the ground, like it's a scene light, um, it's super important. If your uh, vehicle, if your police vehicle, your ambulance, uh, SWAT truck, whatever, is able to get there and provide lighting, wonderful. But there's definitely uh, places where uh, you're simply put, you, you cannot put lighting on there unless it's portable and, and uh, that kind. What I wanted to point out just real quick on this slide is that's an example of night reconstruction. I know that Jack mentioned some of it earlier, but at night, really the light is the tool uh, separate of the software and the drone. So the top image is just like three lights that were off the fire truck. I don't know the maker of the model. The bottom one has some of our, our Fox Free scene lighting on it, but the better the lighting, I should say, the, uh, the better the, uh, the actual imagery, uh, the better the imagery, the better the data, the better the data, the better the decisions. So that's kind of a, a quick way to mention lighting on drones. Next slide, Andy. Um, just, just an example of, a, this is a, actually a setup, it's a mock-up of a portable hospital, so we mentioned that Overwatch thing. This is just a great way to, you know, get eyes on an event, uh, and it just helps with emergency management and, and decision making. Uh, Andy, next slide. And then uh, one of the things, if, especially if you do events or setting up drones, the whole setting up tearing down maintenance, especially if they're longer duration kinds of things, whether it's even at a command post, um, it's gonna be really important to be able to have illumination. Um, some departments will only use a uh, red light just so you don't blow your, um, your night vision. Um, but again, I just wanna emphasize whether it's a headlamp or whether it's uh, attached to the drone or whether it's a, a ground scene light or whether it's your, uh, your vehicle light, you need lighting uh, for night operations to really amplify 
what the drone can do. So, um, and then Rick mentioned some great examples of uh, of indoor applications. So, um, I think Andy, we can go on. Oh, that's oh, Rick, why don't you talk about that? So this one's flying through the facility of the behavioral sciences. We're flying through. It just it allows you to see around corners and dark spaces. Or if you had an IR camera, it would see this fine, but not everyone can afford that IR equipment. It's kind of pricey. But with a normal UAV using that Fox 3D light, it offers more than ambient light anywhere you go or applicable light and amount of light you need to get through that room or even into vehicles. Uh, we often perch on the windshield of vehicles and it actually lights up the interior of the car that allows us to be able to see the suspects and or whatever is needed. This is going through the behavioral center again. It's a pretty extensive building we fly through. And a lot of our students, we stand outside and make them have to fly through the interior of the building to show their skills and navigate it. Rick, that was a question from one of the participants was asking how you train people to do this. I mean, do you get buildings like this where you can work or how do you normally do it? Do you have a setup or I saw one of the videos showed them going underneath objects and moving around like obstacles. Well, this location itself was a great center until the COVID hit, got taken over by the state to house homeless. So we lost this facility for now. We have another one in Sonoma we fly through, but in town with my pilots, we'll go to uh, several businesses around the area. And if they're in closed hours, they'll allow us to fly through our warehouses. Um, we have a location, you can look it up on the Nets game pod. It's a shoot house for airsoft, where they have a mock city on the interior. And we're regularly fly through window openings, door openings, all through down the streets. We'll bring in vehicles, fly through the vehicles. And it's something that we do monthly just to keep our skills up because nothing, as we always say, it's burning batteries and stick time is the only way you better keep your skills proficient. Without doing that, if you try to do a cold, you haven't touched your UA in a month, you're going to crash. You're not going to be competent to be able to maneuver through these and have that fine motor skill to make these movements. Uh, I believe this was uh, Tim Martin that was making this flight himself, and he's a captain at uh, Huntington Beach, and he's one of our fellow instructors, one of our lead instructors. He was flying this demo flight you see now. And then Rick, propeller guards, propeller guards, propeller guards, correct? Cannot preach enough about propeller guards. Um, if you can afford the cages, yes, but the downside of the cages is you have smaller props, that requires higher motor speeds. Higher motor speeds cause you to have less battery because they're gonna burn up your batteries faster. Um, like I said, the Mavic Air has been robust. The Mavic Mini, we've had some success with. It does have some connectivity issues when it gets further away. So we have kind of backed away from the two Minis we have. We primarily use the Mavic Airs for interior flight. Um, the Paranapis have been a great tool as well. Although the Autels Evos are a little bigger, their, their indoor capabilities are amazing once you get used to them. This is, this is showing some of the obstacles I was mentioning earlier where they could practice to go on. I think you had the student going up and over that type of thing so they can get practice proficiency like you were mentioning in that burglary. Yeah, this that is an extremely, extremely inexpensive training tool you can use them anywhere we'll set these up in hallways to you know or doorways i know the doorway is seven feet tall but i'm going to limit you to a two by two opening to get through that doorway to make your fine motor skills if you do use this strongly recommend the black pvc and at least a two inch diameter that'll save you a lot of props if you use a three quarter inch or smaller like agriculture pvc or electrical for some reason, those always like to get through your prop guards and you're just gonna be crashing a lot. These larger ones allow you to, you know, make your mistakes and bounce off a little bit and recover as a training tool. I think we spent $75 building probably four sets of those. That's good info. In a little bit of time, that was it. Thank you, sir. So uh, this is uh, Antonio, if you wanna comment on this quick 3D model, courtesy of SkyBrows, and then we'll move into out of box solutions. We'll close out because we're, already out of time, but we want to give our uh, end users what they came for, which was uh, some information about out-of-box solutions here shortly. So you want to comment on how this was made? 
Absolutely. So we talked about decision making and information and mapping. This is taking this. This just came up yesterday. So kudos to uh, Bobby Berry and the entire Skybrows team. This is the autonomous zone in uh, Seattle, Washington. So this is uh, quite a uh, a popular thing on the news right now. And they mapped this uh, this whole zone. Um, I want to say uh, I th I think Bobby said it was something like ten minutes, but they did a 3D map uh, of this, and what it does is these guys are throwing up barricades, they're, they're closing streets. This is a very rapidly uh, evolving location, so this allows them to be able to go back in, and at least if they have to direct any resources or if someone needed to go in there, they would have up to the, to up to the minute, or at least, at least up to the last time they did the map, information. Um, this is a, a big thing in the news right now, but just a, an example of a, a quick map being made uh, in real time for something very topical to make very important life-saving decisions like, do you direct an ambulance in there? Where, um, what, how, all that good information. Thank you, sir. All yes, right, sir. Paul, if you're with us, we'll go over quickly uh, some, the, probably one of the biggest questions that everybody asks, which one do I buy? How much is it? Where do I get it from? What can I, Help me out here. Can you share some insight on that for us? You there, Paul? Myself. Yeah, I'm here. All right, thank uh, you. So yeah, and I see folks talking about the the dual and uh, the different platforms available. Again, it's 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 you know consider your budget what's available, but just three options to put out there, and this is tailored for folks who are kind of starting a program or in that initial period. The uh, recent drone that's come out with the Autel, the Evo 2, there is a standard version. I've flown the standard version, uh, thanks to Antonio and Fox Fury Lighting. The standard version is just not gonna be suitable. It's nothing I would, I would recommend uh, public safety put money in because of the fixed aperture. You're not gonna be able to do anything with it. Um, well, not that you wouldn't be able to do anything with it, but the price difference, if, if, if you're going to go into it, the Evo 2 Pro uh, rugged bundle, which comes with three batteries in a hard case, you've got four times lossless zoom, you've got uh, omnidirectional with upwards obstacle detection. The Evo 1 is, is a, a proven aircraft. We've seen folks fly it indoors with some Fox Fury lighting attached. The remote comes with a built-in screen. So you don't have to have cell uh, connection. I highly recommend that you would have a dedicated um, screen uh, phone that you're flying with, not having the officers use theirs. It doesn't have to have cellular service. But the fact that it has a built-in screen, this it makes this quick and deployable. It comes in a hard case and you're you're you know you're at twenty one hundred dollars. You can 20 megapixels, you can map, model with an aircraft like this, and you get great flight time. There's other comparable uh, aircraft out there, a Mavic 2 Pro, um, a Phantom 4 Pro. These aircraft are around the same price with three batteries. So next is the Mavic 2 Enterprise Dual, which has been getting um, a lot of attention in the chat. This right here has the uh, FLIR sensor on it. It is a 160 uh, by 120, so it's not giving you that super, super high resolution. Uh, you're not gonna be able to do that more in-depth search and rescue. You're not gonna be able to climb to higher altitudes and pick out those small details. However, for that price point, you've seen the videos that we played of the wildfires, uh, the woods fire earlier, in this scene, uh, in this webinar, and for $4,319, you're getting three batteries, which is over an hour of flight time. You're getting attachments of a speaker, a light, which is super bright, a smart remote that has an HDMI output, so you can hook this up to a mo mobile command center, incident commander, doesn't have to look over the pilot's shoulder. Um, this package right here is phenomenal. It comes in a hard case. That comes with some coverage from uh, DJI, which is, it's, it's just a great package. And it's not, it's not the, the Matrice 210, but it's also not that 
cost either. So that package is, is a great one. And then very recently, I don't know if Jack's still on um, the webinar here. Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah, so this right here, the Autel Evo 2 Dual, has just rolled out. 34-minute um, flight time, the same as the Pro version. However, you're getting a dual sensor, and it's got the 640 by 512 uh, FLIR boson sensor, which is pretty, pretty that putting that boson sensor, from what I understand, on that UAV is like a first. Um, and and the price point here is just over twice of that of the Mavic 2 Dual, but the capabilities for for search and rescue and Jack, uh, not uh, yeah, Jack. If you just want to take a few seconds here and just you know a real quick. How, how, you know, your thoughts on this? Uh, we flew this um, uh, Saturday night, matter of fact, uh, and shout out to FLIR for this, for the, 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 uh, the capabilities that this, uh, this sensor has. It's absolutely amazing. Um, it's it's going to blow your XT2s out. There's no, uh, no MSX on this. However, the, uh, the image that you get from the FLIR sensor is, is uh, I would say superior to the XT2, what DJI is offering right now. Um, yeah. The, uh, I flew it inside as well. And uh, while it has just a hair, a little bit of drift, we have a horrible building to fly in. It's, it's got the worst GPS signals in the world, but this is definitely a controllable aircraft inside. Yeah. But the sensor, the sensor on this thing is absolutely amazing. Okay, and then also I do want to mention this does come with the Fox Fury uh, lighting saddle. So the uh, right. Evo Dual uh, with the FLIR Rugged Bundle comes with the Fox Fury lighting so that you can do some of these things, taking it inside and, and having that visibility. Um, so that's great. Thanks, thanks for that information, Jack. And those are kind of the three bundles. Again, this comes with the same thing. You get a, a drone with the controller, three batteries, a charger, a hard case, um, so there are affordable solutions out there for public safety. And I can tell you about the $20,000, the Matrice 300, but there's, there's not enough information. There's not enough space on the slide to really lay those things out. So um, I would say connect, connect with somebody local, um, you know, that can help provide this support or even in these public safety groups. But before I just want to touch on something real quick, if you don't mind. Um, so anybody who's, uh, flying with a crystal sky. If you didn't know already, you can download the Autel software to a crystal sky and, and fly it with the crystal sky as opposed to just a smaller screen or a, a phone. Just uh, want to add that in there. Something a lot of people don't know about. Great point. Great info. Thank you so much. So in summary, uh, I've got a couple quick slides to go over. Basically, I hope that you understand out of this quick overview that if you are properly trained and have the proper certifications and, and do the proper training as these uh, experts have pointed out, you can have basically enhanced decision making by getting real time data. What type of data you get is gonna be based on your type of tool, context and payload, but more resolution equals more accurate information. And even I had to concede on the, uh, the thermal uh, fixed with the optical as, as Mike Chapman and Paul both pointed out, you know, with the, if it's used in the proper context, it's very valuable. Uh, better lighting, I can't agree more, better results in the proper lighting. As Antonio said, they're using red lighting on the command post versus white lights over here. And, and you were talking about you can't fly them in certain areas without lighting. And adding, adding the thermal provides critically important data. It's the, it's the unseen from law enforcement, hazmat, fire, no matter what. It's very valuable data, but it does provide or require a different training aspect. Do not, do not buy a thermal imaging drone equipped and just fly it thinking you can properly interpret it. It takes proper training, trust me. A level one thermography certified individual is 32 hours of training before they'll even let you hold a camera. I believe Paul is a SUAS thermography certified and he understands that. A lot of people may be. We can put varying payloads on these, but it depends on the drone, depends on the power, and don't just think you can buy one and stick anything on it. Uh, as you've seen, drone software applications are amazing. We're going to get more of the experts and share them with that in an additional web webinar. And I hope you got out of Paul's talk that operating them doesn't have to cost you a fortune. Um, Paul, would you like to chime in on these right here that you put in? Yeah, to, to summarize the drone side, side of it, for any of the folks that are, again, starting the program and, and looking how to integrate drones, um, connect with 
a, a local company like whether it's 910 Drones, if you're here in North Carolina, um, or some of these other companies um, within the, the state that, that you're from or the country that you're from, and then look at PD and, and fire departments. One real important thing that I just wanted to make a point is when starting to integrate a program from a fire side, you don't have personnel. So when you respond to the house fire, every person's on a hose, but maybe there are law enforcement folks that are responding that aren't on a hose, but could fly those drone operations. And then vice versa, when law enforcement are responding to certain calls, maybe there's fire uh, fighters who have the drone experience that can support. So if your town, city, municipality is growing, it's supporting one another and, and, and kind of taking it hand in hand. So consider, consider that. How can we support one another when we're busy, um, but they're there, they're standing there hanging out, work together. Um, part 107, COA. If you're, if you're getting started, you got to get that part 107. So look out um, and, and figure out how, how do I get that education? And it's, and it's not expensive. I mean, reach out, connect with anyone who you've heard talk today and, and they can give you some guidance and direction. Um, training, training, training. We've heard everybody kind of talk about it. it. It doesn't matter what you're doing. And drones are a tool. Um, that, that provide a new advanced capability. So it's, it's, it's just how, how do we put this tool into our workflow? How do we integrate this? And there's lots of knowledge and information out there. Uh, so, so just kind of do that. Uh, reach out and uh, find what it is that you're looking for because it's there. Well, we answered a lot of the questions that are in the chat room, but I want to thank everyone for coming and it's recorded. We're going to split this in two sections because YouTube usually requires to be under an hour. So we'll split it in two sections and post it on YouTube. We're going to send out some emails, mass emails to the group, uh, some survey questions, some additional resources. Thanks to everyone that participated, especially uh, Fox Fury, Antonio and his group for kind of facilitating and getting us all together. His, his contact information, uh, 910 drones. Paul has been instrumental in doing that and, uh, connecting uh, us with all mobile video was kind enough to donate the the drone the Fox Fury's donating the light and obviously FLIR with Mike Chapman who's provided us a lot of valuable information expertise and donating a K1 through us uh, and uh, my contact information is here if you need anything but most of all we want you to know we will do a special announcement in a few days we'll do it on Facebook live and YouTube and some others to announce the winners of those prizes. We'll contact you directly. Uh, if you are winning the FLIR K1, you have to be inside the United States or Canada, I believe, due to international trades, uh, arms regulations law because of the camera. But the rest of them, I believe, may be open for international winners. We will let you know shortly. And I'm gonna hit stop share here and thank my uh, experts and everyone, especially, I didn't have the bios for Jack and all the other guys who were who, who joined us today. I can't thank you enough for uh, Mike and Mike, Mike Leo, uh, Jack White, everybody, Rick, especially coming in last minute, helping us out. Uh, the, uh, we have so many other things we want to share with you and with your constructive feedback, if we'll send you out in the survey, we'll ask you basically what would you like to see for part two and uh, a lot more information to come. I really appreciate uh, Paul, Antonio, you guys want to chime in and add anything? I want to just say thanks to, uh, again, the, the panelists that I had come on to help discuss this. Brandon Fitzhu with the Spring Lake Fire Department, Michael Leo with FDNY Robotics, and then Jack White with Mansfield PD. Um, anyone that, that tuned in, again, if you're in the North Carolina area, and if you're not in the North Carolina area and you want to learn more about drones and implementing a program, you know, reach out, 910drones.com. Um, we're on LinkedIn, Facebook, but any questions you have, reach out and, and even you know, we'll help get you connected with local folks if that's the case. But thank you for all your time. Thank you, Antonio, for, for helping put this together. My pleasure. One, two things that I just want to add real quick, everybody. Uh, one, thank you to everybody that either participated uh, or, or tuned in. But um, we had a huge international audience we did not expect. Um, we had incredible uh, chats that we did not expect. So what we could do to tailor the experience for everybody is really use that feedback. What did you like? What did you, you know, what could you maybe do without, you know, what, 
how we how can we provide value so that when we do the breakout on law or fire or or hazmat you know do you want more video do you want more photos just that would be really great info so um if you could share that with us it'll help us make it better and uh we took a risk of putting this together but uh hopefully you guys got value out of it his brother chapman owner michael leo please michael leo share with share with us thank you for coming in too especially with your experience we really appreciate it Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate being here. Um, I, I got to learn a lot too while I. Uh, you got to hear me. I lost all audio. Sorry. Rick's there too. Okay, Mike, go ahead. Yeah, I, I appreciate being here, and uh, uh, like I say, whenever we do these things, I learn a lot off of uh, other people, and uh, I enjoyed being here. And then, uh, you know, we've been absolutely like the rest of the country swamped uh, in the uh, from the pandemic to the uh, to the uh, protest, but uh, uh, um, you know. I think uh, as I free up, maybe I'll be able to participate a little more in the next one. All right. We thank you and appreciate it. Rick, are you still there? Okay, you seem to lost audio. Mike Chapman, you there? Yeah, I just want to say thank you to everybody uh, on behalf of FLIR. I uh, really appreciate everybody's attendance and uh, support. Uh, if you didn't get anything that you uh, uh, needed or wanted to ask on this, uh, you can certainly uh, reach out, you've got the contact information on the slides. If you didn't write it down today, uh, just take a look when Andy posts that and feel free to reach out to any one of us. And uh, we'll definitely, uh, if we can help you ourselves, we'll point you in the right direction. Uh, as I said, uh, there's nothing about this by company or by individual, it's all about teams. And so you can see all the people on here that are sharing, we're learning with each other, from each other, teaching each other, and uh, that's gonna continue to happen. So um, just encourage you to share, ask, and uh, we'll all learn together. Especially thank you all who attended from outside of the U.S. who are on different time zones. Uh, I've seen Philippines. I've seen all kinds of places. So we really appreciate it. Um, and like I say, we'll, we'll post the recording and we'll send an email out with a survey, some informational links from our partners here, and then we'll post the announcement on the prizes here soon. So without any further ado, we went over by oh, many minutes. Coach. There he is. <laughs> yeah. What's that? We lost you for a second. You completely cut out. So go ahead. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. But we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And uh, y'all have a great day. Thank you as well. Mm -hmm.